Hello, in this lecture we're going to talk about comparative advantage exchange rates and globalization chapter 9. We're going to start off with our quote from Andrew Carnegie. He was the owner of U.S. Steel. He was at a time in the 19th century where there was a lot of industrialization, a lot of competition, and so he was had some basically some cutthroat competition and became one of the first monopolies. He was around in a similar time, in the same time area, as one of the first monopolies, which would be Standard Oil as well. And his quote is, One of the purest fallacies is that trade follows the flag. Trade falls to the lowest price current. If a dealer in any colony wishes to buy Union Jacks, he would order them from Britain's worst foe if he could save a sixpence. So obviously this is kind of a cutthroat capitalist type of idea, and that is that people respond to and firms respond to incentives and those incentives being financial incentives so and we see this idea today so if we want to incentivize firms or see firms do certain things probably not going to be the easiest way to persuade firms to do certain things by appealing to their sense of nationality or their sense of national pride or at least that's not going to be as effective most likely than having incentives that deal with profit and that's uh, going to be the just kind of that quote there now we're going to go into talking about trade between countries in this case so explain the principle of competitive advantage we're going to explain why economists and lay people's view of trade differ we're going to summarize the source of the u.s comparative advantage and discuss some concerns about the future in the u.s economy and discuss how exchange rates are determined and when their role is in equalizing the trade flow so the principles of comparative advantage so we've talked about a comparative advantage before and note we can apply the term the idea of comparative advantage to basically like two individuals or we can compare it to firms to firms and we can compare it to countries we're going to kind of compare it to countries at this time so the principle of comparative advantage is that as long as the relative opportunity cost of producing goods differ among countries then there are potential gains from trade so note what we have here relative differences in opportunity cost this does not mean that two countries need an absolute advantage in in two different types of production as long as their opportunity costs differ then it's usually the case that they can benefit through specialization and trade so that's kind of the good news is that trade is one of the key factors that makes countries able to produce more allows us to consume more so opportunity cost is what most uh, must be given up in one good in order to get another good so our model is going to be in place of two goods but re remember whenever we talk about producing something anything we do if we produce one thing we're losing the production of whatever else we could have produced with those goods and resources whatever else we could have produced with those goods and resources is the opportunity cost so if we think of this example then we got the US and Saudi Arabia the two things we're going to produce we're just talking about two different things we've got oil and food food being agriculture most likely farming large-scale farming so in the US if we just had uh, concentrate hundred percent of our time on oil we're saying that we're gonna get a hundred barrels of oil as opposed to Saudi Arabia putting a hundred percent of their time in oil and producing a thousand barrels of oil and if we go to the other extreme in the US if we produce zero of our time on oil of course we would produce zero oil and we would have 100, uh, 1,000 units of food. And if Saudi Arabia puts a zero time in resources for oil, and um, they'd have zero oil and 100 units of food. So we can see here that, that the U.S. has an absolute advantage and a comparative advantage in the production, I'm sorry, of food. And in terms of Saudi Arabia, we're going to say that there's an absolute advantage and a comparative advantage in the production of oil. Now this happens to be the case where there's both an absolute advantage and a comparative advantage. But remember, that doesn't necessarily have to be the case. For example, if the U.S. happened to be better at if they concentrated on one or the other and they were able to produce more if they spent all their time on one or the other, once again, as long as the opportunity cost uh, is different, even if there's an absolute advantage by one individual or one country in both areas, generally can still benefit from trade. So let's see if we look at this graphically. Then, of course, we have our graph here. This is going to be our production possibility frontiers for the U.S. and for Saudi Arabia. So if there was no trade, this is the production possibility possible for the two countries. Oil on the Y, food on the X. And remember, anywhere on the line, that's where these two countries could produce. They can produce anywhere on that line, be efficient. Anywhere inside the line, 
that would mean they would be inefficient. They're not using our resources anywhere outside the line. Not possible. Same over here. On the line, efficient. Outside the line, not possible. So the U.S. has a comparative advantage in food, and Saudi Arabia has a comparative advantage in oil, of course. Now you can think about, well, what would happen if we just combine these two lines if they traded theoretically and they can cross the border and not have any trading problems? You would think that we can just add these two lines together. And if we did that, if we added these two lines together, it wouldn't be a straight line. It would be a curve. It would be an outward bowed curve. And that's, that's going to be the production possibility frontier. And that's why there's a benefit to trade because that outward bowed curve allows us uh, to add, to have more benefit because of that difference in trade off because of the differences in the slope of these lines, allows us to optimize and, and produce at a higher place given trade. So if we had an example like this, for example, um, trade, if Italy came in and arranged in Saudi Arabia to trade 500 barrels of oil to the U.S. For, 100, for 120 tons of food, and the U.S. will trade 500 tons of food to Saudi Arabia for 120 barrels of oil, and then Italy keeps the 380 barrels of oil. So they came in and basically are facilitating the trade and getting paid off in the meantime for that. If we looked at that graphically then, where does that trade uh, allow both the United States and Saudi Arabia to be? Out here, past the production possibility frontier. So this is a huge fact. The, in, the implications of this is that we are basically consuming way outside what we could be producing if there was no trade. And the same, of course, with Saudi Arabia. The idea being that trade is typically good. Trade is typically good. It's going to have a lot of good things because it generally allows us to uh, consume outside what we could have been consuming without trade. So dividing up the gains from trade. So who's win I, although we're both better off, there's going to be questions. Well, who's the winners and who's the losers? When we're talking about trade between countries, we're going to want to see who's benefiting more and or, and or less. So the more com competition, the less the trade the trader gets. So clearly, if, if we're specializing in an area, and that's where our opportunity cost is best, but there's also a lot of competition in that area, then they're gonna, we're not going to be doing as well. Uh, smaller countries get larger pro proportion of the gain than larger companies, countries. And th this is really important because the small companies usually need a lot more of the gain. So notice if, if we're a small country, we may not have that many resources. If we're talking about Saudi Arabia, and they, they, their farming, may, the resources available may not be great for other types of things like farming. Then we may not have the human capital or the, res or the natural resources to do a lot of different things. And therefore, uh, they, they would benefit a lot by concentrating a lot of times by, on one particular thing where they have a particular advantage and then trading for that, for that thing. So if they were not able to do that, then of course they wouldn't be able to concentrate all their resources on that one thing and they'd have to spread them out and they wouldn't be as, as efficient in those things. So the specialization in smaller countries oftentimes is, is a huge benefit. And of course that's really needed for smaller countries be in many ways in order to increase the consumption. Countries producing goods with economy. Now remember that economy of scale means that a larger um, industry does better than smaller industries, meaning a larger company generally does better than smaller companies because they're utilizing better the fixed costs. So certain industries allow themselves to do better actually as the companies get larger. And one of those would be farming is an example oftentimes of an economy of scale. And that's one of the reasons you see that the farms in the U.S. have gotten to be very large rather than a lot of small farms. We have a, we have a lot less very large farms. And part of that is due to this, this fact that there's economies of scale. So they could also be winners in terms of, of trade.